You're listening to the Vint Podcast, bringing you expert interviews, alternative market insights, and exclusive access to the world of wine and spirits investing. Enjoy the show. Hey, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of the Vint Podcast. My name is Brady, joined by Billy. Both of us have stripes on today, and you would know that if you were watching us on our YouTube channel. The podcast is now on YouTube, so if you haven't checked this out over there, um, go on over. It's a great way to view our content and, and um, get a sense of a fuller sense of the conversation with our guests. So we hope that we'll see you over there. Billy, how have you been? Doing very well. I'm excited for this episode, not only because our guest was very exciting and energetic. It was a great interview, but also I'm excited to talk about some of our maybe unique things that we've been drinking lately. We haven't really touched on those in a while, so it's going to be a great yeah. episode. They've been talking to a few of our uh, clients or a few of our investors about um, their own wines that they're drinking and been able to share some cool things recently. It's um, fun to see people, like we've said in the past, growing alongside their interest in wine and, and spirits along with investing. Um, I've been trying to grow interest in my local community here recently, and I kind of had a blunder this past weekend. <laughs> um, I started Wine Society in my sort of neighborhood, but also sort of the surrounding area. We have a really mm -hmm. robust Facebook page for our, for our neighborhood. There's probably almost a thousand people on this Facebook and they talk about, you know, road work and break-ins and <laughs> anything that's <laughs> happening. Um, yeah. But so I, I originally spun this uh, wine society up out of that and got a good many people to kind of join the group and express interest. And we had our first event and it went great. So we had our second this past weekend and we had a dozen people RSVP so I bought all this stuff, you know, charcuterie, cheese, you know, open wine that I thought was interesting. And, you know, it wasn't just like any old bottle. I like tried to pull some interesting bottles out of my cellar and uh, two people showed up. So <laughs> it <laughs> how, was how um, far apart were these again? So we do it every 10 weeks. So it was only five a year. Um, That's such so a random a thing. It's a random yeah, time well, period. Monthly was too often. Um, just for like for our schedule personally, and I think like for some of our group people, so I thought, but apparently 10 weeks isn't <laughs> good either. But I thought that it would give people enough time to kind of plan between each one and to, you know, to make sure that they could be there. And also I recognize that it can be a financial commitment if you're, you know, bringing bottles and stuff like that. So anyways, it's supposed to be every 10 weeks and I have to wait another nine weeks to redeem myself um, <laughs> for the group, hopefully to get back on good footing. But well, I we did a... We did wine say, or red wine 101 this past weekend. So maybe people just don't like red wine. Maybe when we do white wine 101, it'll be yeah. better. <laughs> yeah, spreading the wine gospel is hard, man, sometimes. Sometimes you just got to drink yeah. your own wine. <laughs> so <laughs> what What were some of the things you opened or what? what's something interesting you've had at least? Um, so I, I, was, I was going back and forth trying to figure out, okay, what are a few – varieties that people would have to taste to get kind of get a sense of okay red wine isn't just this monolithic thing there's white wine and there's red wine all red wine tastes the same so i was going to do like a cab a cab franc uh, uh zin and then maybe like a pinot noir it was kind of my original goal that i was going to do um i didn't have much like like i wanted to have a lambrusco but i didn't have it i wanted to uh, have some just like uh, maybe more like effervescent or lighter expressions. Uh, but I didn't have any of that stuff on hand, so I kind of went for the, you know, those that I, I just named. And so we ended up having um, a, oh, I'm, I'm forgetting what it was. It was a James Berry for um, Syrah from Paso. It was like 2014. Um, and I cannot remember mm. the producer or which it was right now. And we also had, the uh, Bordeaux blend from Barbersville, the, their Octagon Virginia wine. So that would that kind of worked as like the older world style expression of some of those varieties. And then we did we had some Ridge Geyserville um, because someone was asking about Zinfandel and like white Zinfandel, and so we had some like Ridges in, and uh, so that was cool. And nice. then someone brought. Uh, this Concord Red that he made. So this was the oh. highlight of the um, event. One of 
uh, or group members made 30 bottles of this Concord red wine in his house. 14.5% cool. bottled this month. And I got the second bottle uh, of the 30 that he made. So that was really cool. Uh, shout out to Ben Davis uh, making this wine. So, yeah. Nice. Did you tell the folks drinking the red Zinfandel that that's what white Zinfandel is also made out of? It's just the same grape. <laughs> yeah, there, I, was, I was like, white Zinfandel is, well, and you can maybe clarify some of this. I was just like, white Zinfandel is not actually like a real thing, right? <laughs> yeah. I mean, it was basically invented out of mistake, like a lot of things in wine, but it was just a, mm -hmm. a stuck a stuck fermentation. And what a stuck fermentation means is basically like a wine starts fermenting and then the yeast just crap out for whatever reason. Maybe the, the sugar content's too high. They were working too fast, but the yeast just stopped fermenting. So they were just left with like this wine that had spent a little bit time with the skin. So it got a little pinkish and had some sugar left. And they were like, well, we're not going to waste this. Let's just bottle it and see if anybody likes it. And then there you go. Everybody liked it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That was neat. Um, and I think what else we had. I yeah, like how your old world expression things. was from Virginia. That's kind of funny. Yeah, it really is though. Like in terms of the style of that particular wine and it was like a 2016, so it wasn't old, but it, uh, you know, it wasn't recent release. So it had a couple of years on it, which is cool. And then the Syrah that we had, like I said, was a 2014. So I think it was neat for folks to be able to have something that was, you know, approaching 10 years. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we went as our, on our retreat, we went to Barbersville and got to meet the winemaker there who made that wine and he is French and has a very old world palate. So I'm not arguing with you on the, on the wine. I just think it's, it's kind of funny that, that, um, you know, growing up in Virginia, never thought I'd hear people say that. Well, I realized that I actually don't have much Bordeaux at all. And so that might be like really wild, uh, for some people, but I have like a ton of champagne, a good amount of Burgundy, a good amount of Napa, um, even like way more like Italian and German wines, Austrian wines, than I even do Bordeaux. So I didn't have, I didn't have much, uh, without having to go out and, and purchase something. So that was, that was what I went with. We opened a Cab Franc too, from a different Virginia producer. Yeah. Oh, nice. I had, so I've tasted, not all of these were bottles. Some of these were just tastings while I was out. Um, so I'll go in order too. We also had a Cab Franc. That was kind of neat. Um, I got to taste that next to a Carmenere um, from Chile. Um, and it was, it was kind of interesting because the, the bartender- Was it Cab Franc, Chile, South American, or was it? No, the Cab Franc was really traditional. It was Chinon um, from Loire. So it was okay. um, from like, so the Loire Valley, Chinon is a subregion within. Um, yeah. And it, it was a really cool expression. And the, it's one of these local wine bars we go to and the, the server was actually trying to learn more about wine himself. Like he just, He's only been there for a little while. So I had, I actually told him to taste the Carmenere next to the Cab Franc because their Carmenere is known for its pyrazines and so is Cab Franc, but their expression is just so different from, from the Loire. Um, and of course the, the accompanying flavors as well are so different. So that was neat. Um, we also had over the weekend, I had a traditional Austrian kind of red blend uh, from Bergenland. It was just, I assume it was mostly Blau Frankish and Zweigel, maybe some Saint Laurent. But what I thought was interesting is it was at one of these little kind of more hipster kind of cop, natural wine bars nearby us. We were just out walking the neighborhood and they just had the name of the producer. It was some long traditional Austrian German name. And they basically said like, you know, red fruit, kind of bright, mineral driven, typical for the region or like traditional Bergen then. And I was just like, I, I knew exactly what they meant. I was like, sweet, love it. But like, who else just walking around the neighborhood randomly is like, ah, yes, these traditional, uh, traditional. Bergen wines. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> they were like, oh yeah, like indicative of the region. I was just like, who who else is reading this? And like, I was like, yeah. cool. All right, works for me. Um, but I think the highlight of the weekend, and I have my um, my big wine books uh, thing out, um, was the Turpot um, we had mm. on uh, one of the wine bars as well. Uh, the producer was, I have it up here, Oriol Artigas, um, and it was called Seme, Seme Negre. Um, it was from Catalonia, and basically Trepat, T-R-E-P-A-T, is a traditional red varietal from Catalonia. Looking in my book of grapes here, I think it's native to the area. Um, and it's typically just used in pink cava, rosé cava, rosado. Um, and when I was doing my studies, and I, I think I might have mentioned this on maybe one of our other podcasts. I 
somebody had mentioned the grape in one of my things I was reading. And they were like, if you ever find it single varietal, you should try it. And randomly enough, we were offered it and it was really good. This was kind of like a Cherisuolo darker rosé style, but um, really cool. Um, and I was really excited to see it. So had to share. Nice. Yeah, I haven't heard of that. I didn't know that's so basically like a large percentage of rosé cava is that variety or like is it not super No, no, it's, it's, it's it, 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 there is a mix of grapes that are in rosé cava. It, it is not super uh -huh. common and, and the single variety or extra hard. It's just one of the, the blending grapes that are allowed in rosé cava. So they can include mm -hmm. like Grenache, Noir, uh, Pinot Noir, this grape. Um, there's, there's a few other ones as well. I think mean, Carignan mm -hmm. can be allowed. Um, but yeah, it's just one of those. And it's like an obscure blending grape that you never really see that much on its own. So, Yeah, I remember the other one that uh, we had was a, a Dura from, uh, if I'm saying it right, from Por Portugal. Mm -hmm. um, Tariga Nacional, Tariga Franca, and was the other Rorish mm. Tinto Rorish I'm not, I'm not seeing no I don't think so I'm not seeing the other one I'm just looking online here at some of these different varieties I'm not seeing the third one That what you're saying isn't it though but that was interesting never had I mean yeah I haven't um, had a wine from there before <clears throat> and that was what the, the lady who brought it she went into the wine shop and she was, I forget what she said she was looking for, um, but the wine shop owner said, oh, have you had anything from Portugal? And she said, oh, like, you know, Verde. He was like, oh, like, try this. And so she had never, you know, she just kind of brought it up as recommendation. So that's cool. I love that. Yeah. No, I mean, they're great value to be found in Portugal. The, those two grapes are two of their longest lived, you know, thick, higher tan and darker skin. They're, they're prized for making port. Um, and the other grape I was suggesting was their, their name for Tempranillo. Um, but there's a ton uh, okay. of grapes that can be made up there, um, that are widely yeah. grown. So, um, yeah, it was a pretty even blend of the three. It was like 40, 30, 30 or something like that. Or, um, yeah, it was interesting. It was fine. It was good. Nice. Um, and we had yeah. a cool conversation about like price of wine, sort of like, I just kind of asked like what people's just sort of personal conceptions of what value was and we're like what they expect to spend when they go out and buy wine thought that was kind of interesting because it led us into a conversation of trying to figure out why people will spend more for a bottle of wine five glasses versus a bottle of spirits that you might get like 15 or 18 or whatever the number is i forget um out of and so that was that was kind of interesting just talking about like value and consumer habits it's really cool outside of one of these wine bars we were actually like a block away and i just heard a dude being like yeah dude you're you're so baller if like you can find like an $80 bottle that like nobody really knows. Like if you can find a wine, it's like 80 bucks, but it's like really baller. Like you're a G man. And I was like, yeah. And I was like, that's, that's not impressive. Anybody can find a good $80 bottle. Like you can find a really cool one. That's like, you know, under 20 or, you know, 20 to 30. That's like out of this world. That's cool. But he, you know, I didn't, I didn't stop him. So I just overheard in LA. <laughs> I was reading out of Psalms, uh, wine simple uh, a little bit before uh people came over because was, what was i looking at something about oh something with service temperature i was like trying to figure out this one line that um we, we had anyways and uh he was talking about uh, i was in the section he was talking about um how he wouldn't his threshold was like 12 dollars, or he would never spend less than 12 dollars for a bottle of wine or he was like telling people not to spend less than 12 dollars um hmm. so we talked about that a little bit too um and some group members were like yeah i feel like you can't make like physically can't make wine in terms of producing it for under ten dollars if you're like not cutting corners and stuff like that. So like yeah. Yeah. Yeah, there's economies of scale and in production that need to be met to be able to to do that type of thing. Yeah. I, I think that's a fairly I mean in the US at least, I wouldn't spend under twelve. You can if you're over in Europe or elsewhere, um, it's possible, I would say. I do still stand by TJ's uh seven dollar um Gerard Semener, though. I um yeah, I think that breaks the mold. And they have a Vino Verde for like six dollars or five dollars that breaks the mold too, I think. So I don't know. Yeah. They just they maybe they do some like weird magic stuff. I don't know how they get <laughs> juice. I'm talking on the whole. I don't yeah, no Vino Verde, there are some really affordable yeah. ones that are pretty cool. And same with 
Same with like really like there's some cava like the the Freshene Cordon Negro. Um, I think that's like nine ninety nine even here. So like, and uh, I think I I don't mind that one. It's it's traditionally method. Well, it's good to me. What I what I don't understand is how they uh, TJ's does. I don't know if it's out in California, but in Virginia they had a four ninety nine uh, Rosé Pinot Noir. I don't know how they do that <laughs> at four ninety nine, but it was. Very, very good. Uh, myself, so. It's probably not all anyway. Pinot Noir. But, yeah, um, <laughs> yeah, well, cool. Well, so uh, a couple of things. So the reason we brought up uh, Brady trying to host events and interesting grapes, we um, Vint is having an event in New York at some point here. We're working on planning. If you're interested, reach out <laughs> to Brady. He's trying to get a head count of all the local Vinters um, that are going to be going. I don't know if that's the name we use. And then we have a really interesting interview with Christy Wentz from Vino Head. Brady, do you want to talk a little bit about who she is and, and how yeah. we came across her? Yeah, sure. Yeah, uh, a couple more details I actually can share on the event. Um, it's going to be February 24th. Um, uh, pretty sure it's 7 p.m. We're still working on nailing down the venue. We're in the final stages of that right now. So um, there's a chance that, that time could change. But right now it is February 24th. That's a Friday in probably midtown manhattan um at 7 p.m so yeah reach out if you would like an rsvp form we'd love to have you there uh both for current and prospective investors or folks who just want to come hang out drink some wine and, and meet um me and maybe i don't know if any other members of our team will be there but certainly some current investors as well so and then in terms of our interview today yeah we did have an awesome conversation with uh christy wens who is the senior managing director at vino head uh, she's a writer, an educator around wine. She's done some WSET courses, intro courses for WSET, and just really has um, a lot of knowledge about wine across the U.S. because I think her, her writing with Vino Head and the work there, but also she's just a passionate student and drinker um, of cool wines. We talked a lot about uh, wines from Michigan uh, in the opening part of the episode, and yeah, it gives a lot of great recommendations. Um, on wine, wine culture, and yeah, we're, we're excited for you to listen into this conversation. Yeah, and it was one of my favorites in a while. So yeah, enjoy. Here's, here's Christy. Hey, Christy, thanks so much for joining us today. Absolutely, happy to be here. Yeah, no, I love your background, a lot of colors and um, uh uh, Gatsby, uh -huh. I love that. Yep, yep. Some um, wine glasses over there. <laughs> are you a um, are you kind of all things art and culture along with wine, or sort of what's your? Uh, I would say mostly disposition music, but I'm kind of Fitzgerald obsessed, so that's the the connection there. And nice. Hemingway, Hemingway and Fitzgerald are kind of my my go tos, yeah. but otherwise mostly music. Nice. Are you a big like wine label? Uh, <gasps> like kind of. You, you know, big on the labeling? Not really. Not really. Sometimes, like, yeah. sometimes one will jump out and I'll grab it because of that, but mm -hmm. not really. Nice. I was going to say on the Hemingway side, I've I've done, like, a, a small, um, basically following his footsteps over the years, like, travel-wise. Like, yep. I just got to, I went to his place, or his place, his grave, in Idaho last year. Oh, but, that's uh, cool. <laughs> I forgot that's out yeah. there. That's right. Yeah, I've been to his birthplace yeah. in uh, Oak Park. Here in Chicago. Oh, no, yeah. yeah. So my mom is from Oak Park. So oh, we awesome. we we had done that. I've done Key West, Rhonda, and Cuba. So I awesome. just had to see where he died, and I was just like, I'm oh good my god, to go. I love that because I've done the same thing with Fitzgerald, and I don't tell anybody because I feel like, oh my god, I'm like chasing a dead guy around places he was. And it feels weird. I'm like, he wrote that book in that oh. house, and I have pictures of the house. And, yeah. It's totally normal. Oh my, Everybody yeah, does. I think so. <laughs> <laughs> I think so. Why not? Yeah. Awesome. Oh, cool. Yeah, so we, we brought you on to talk only about um, literature. So that's Perfect. it. Um, Perfect. <laughs> well, speaking <laughs> of writing, um, we've Nick has been friends with Josh at Vino Head for a while. Um, I got to meet him for lunch last year. Um, can you tell us a little bit about how you got connected with Vino Head and like what it is and a little bit more about your background as a whole? Yeah, totally. So and it's actually funny. I think Nick was our first um, corkboard interview that we did. They, one of it, he was either the first or the second. Oh, cool. Um, so it's our corkboard features are kind of this Q&A thing. So that's how I got to know Nick. Um, yeah. But Vino Head, it came up actually it, through an Instagram connection. <laughs> that's how I met Josh. Um, probably, gosh, it would have been back in 
2020, I think. Um, and so I started writing some reviews for him. And then shortly after that, he needed a, a managing editor and I jumped on board. So that was kind of the whole entry into Vino Head. And it's been, mm -hmm. it's been there, gosh, yeah, since 2020 now. So it's been pretty cool. Which is a decade ago, basically, right? in, in gosh, yeah, <laughs> this Human <time>. years. <laughs> yeah, we don't even remember. Yeah, right. It's not even dog years. I mean, it's like human years for that debacle. It was Can you fun. give our, our listeners a little background on what vino head is yeah absolutely then... so vino head is a right now it's a weekly newsletter um comes out every friday and we give anywhere from six to eight wine reviews on stuff that our tasting lab is drinking um and it's all stuff that we just drink in our everyday lives so it's stuff that we're buying on our own that we're having at restaurants um we'll get some samples sent to us but it they only make it if we actually like them um, so it's not pay for play. There's absolutely no, um, advertising dollars going into Vino heads. So it's just really what we're drinking. Um, the tasting lab, we've got writers from across the country, um, some sommeliers, some just wine educators, some just consumers that know wine really well and like to write. So there's a whole kind of mixed bag of our, our tasting lab. Um, and we're always on the lookout for new talent and writing and people that are interested in, in that aspect of wine. Um, and that comes out every Friday. We have that corkboard feature I mentioned earlier that comes out um, in the newsletter as well. Q and A feature on people, either in wine or loosely connected to wine. Um, but the interviews are kind of fun. They're like, you know, like, you know, would you rather, you know, spend the night in a rainforest or at the North Pole? Like, they're just kind of random questions and and designed in a way to really get to know somebody and kind of break down those barriers, uh, which I think is kind of what Vino Head is in its essence. It's our, kind of our purpose is to break down those barriers in wine. Um, it's, you know, oftentimes it can be so kind of stuffy and unapproachable, and we just want to open it up and make a community out of it. So we're, you know, developing the community, talking with people rather than at people. And, you know, we're, we're living in the real world and drinking wine and telling people where we're drinking it and why we're drinking it. Um, it's less focused on, you know, the reviews are less focused on, you know, here's what we're tasting in the wine and the structure, like we're not doing kind of that educational breakdown. It's more like, you know, here's a couple flavors, but here's where we enjoyed it and how it went with this and maybe pair it with this and, you know, date night wine or just take it out by the pool kind of wine and just making it part of a lifestyle. Um, Cause for us, us, that's what it is. It's, you know, it's about drinking it with friends and family and people that we enjoy spending time with. And, and also about meeting other people too, which I think is the cool mm -hmm. thing about wine. It's like you make friends over wine. Um, and it's, so we're really just trying to reach as many people as we can, um, especially focus on the millennials and Gen Z's and, and kind of talking their language and making wine a part of the lifestyle. What's the value in your mind of someone hearing about a wine from Christy? versus James Suckling. Um, Cause like for us, like, for, you know, for us, the scores and vintage ratings and stuff in our side of the business still, uh, you know, oh, yeah. is still something that we kind of need to talk about for sure. Uh, when we're approaching some of these wines, but uh, definitely I don't know a, a 21 year old who cares about right. yeah. James Suckling. Yeah, yeah. Kind of I would also say <laughs> okay. before you dive in, the one difference might be that James Suckling only gives like 99s and 100s and I'm sure <laughs> yeah, yeah. he criticizes the wine sometimes. Yeah, exactly. exactly. <laughs> yeah, we... Point two point scale. <laughs> right. Well, we, um, I would say, you know, they're kind of a necessary evil. Like I still look at them too, even though I don't want to. And I feel like there's a lot of people that way, like we don't want to look at them. We don't want them to matter, but then you still look. Um, but I would say, you know, I think the value of either a point system or trusting a reviewer is getting to know who they are and what they like. Cause not everybody's going to like the same wines I like. Um, and same with my writers. Like I don't always like the wines that they're drinking. They don't always like the wines that I'm drinking because it's so personal. Um, and so it's really about, you know, kind of describing the scenario, why we liked it, why we'd enjoy it, some kind of unique things about it because the, the flavors and the smells, all that stuff is so subjective, right? Like what I smell might not be what you smell. So it's, it's hard to really get into that. I mean, there's, you know, you can kind of say, okay, red fruits or, you know, tree fruits or whatever, and that you're kind of in that ballpark and you can, you know, get more micro from there. So I, I don't know. I think it's, I think once you get to know the reviewer and start to understand the kinds of wines they like. And, you know, the authenticity behind them, then you can start to kind of connect a little bit more and figure out like, okay, I know I tried that wine that, you know, you know, somebody drank last week and, I, you know, I kind of liked it. So maybe I'll, you know, pay attention to their reviews a little bit more. Um, the reviews that make it into the newsletter for us are generally wines that we've enjoyed. We don't put anything in there that we didn't like. <laughs> so you're not going to see some, you know, mm -hmm. criticism in there. Um, but there are times, you know, in my, in my other sides of my world where I write about wines where I will say, you know, this one 
you know, it's not my style, but I can objectively say that, you know, here, you know, it's got the structure's good, this is good, you know, I think it'll appeal to people that like this style of wine. So you can be fair about it without having to, you know, make every wine sound like it's phenomenal, because you're not going to think yeah. every wine's phenomenal. <laughs> I don't. <laughs> you know, there's some I just really don't like, but I know other people do, and that's okay. Yeah. So how did you get into wine, wine writing, the review stuff? Yeah, take us all the way oh, back to the beginning. Well, we don't want to go all the way back. Okay, fine. <laughs> this is a long, Far, long Far enough way. so we don't get scared. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> it's a long winding path. Um, my first interest in wine really started out in uh, California. I was on a road trip, and wine wasn't really – I drank it occasionally and liked it, but it wasn't something that was on my radar um and this is it's kind of an embarrassing story but we're driving through the desert and i really have to go to the bathrooms for like i gotta find a place to stop and we found uh this and this was probably two decades ago temecula california so at the time you know now it's like the disneyland of wine down there right there's so many spots <laughs> but at the time there was just like a handful of wineries we're like oh my god i have a bathroom just stop in one of those and uh and we did i went to the bathroom and came out and they're like oh you want to do a tasting we're like, okay <laughs> i've never really done one of these before but sure i was like all right that was kind of fun so we stopped at another one and uh guy comes out and he's like oh you just missed the tour and we're like we have no idea what he's talking about like we just wanted to taste some wine we've never done this before and he's like oh come on back <laughs> he spent he was the owner he spent two hours with us just talking to us about how to make wine the business side and, and getting to the economics the market like it was just a whole and, and i was just eating it up i'm like this is amazing and that was kind of my after that Every trip it involved going to wineries, you know, every road trip across the country. If we found one in the middle of Nebraska, we'd stop. Like it just became kind of what we did. Um, and so it, that really kind of got the ball rolling into my entry into tasting wines and enjoying wines. And then, oh gosh, in 2015, I was on another vacation. Um, we were staying on a vineyard at an Airbnb property and uh, ended up getting to know the, the owner of the Airbnb property really well. And they owned the vineyard and they needed some help tie in vines. I was like, well, we'll do that. They're like, no, no, it's your vacation. I'm like, yeah, but that would be cool. Like, that'd be an amazing vacation for me. <laughs> yeah, and so right. we ended up tying vines for a day and, and, then, uh, and then met the marketing director for the Finger Lakes Wine Country Association there. And so started talking to her and my background is marketing and PR. And she's like, oh, you like to write? She's like, I could use some, you know, some articles. And so it kind of took off from there. So Finger Lakes, I always say, is kind of my, my home away from home because that kind of really kicked off the career. Um, but it wasn't, it, you know, kind of wasn't a direct path even after that. It was a lot of trial and error of testing, you know, different, different hats, different things, see what I liked, what fit. Um, and even now, like I still, I do so many different things that it's hard to, you know, I'm not really, you know, I do all kinds of things and I just, anything and everything to do with wine that I can get my hands on. It's, I love it. I just love it. So definitely a winding path, but I'm no longer in the corporate America world. I did get out of that. And it is wine full time now. So. <laughs> yeah, Billy, Billy is a huge Nebraska wine guy. I'm always joke with Billy that he, he, he well, probably likes wines if they're from a state that doesn't actually produce wine. Right. Yeah. No, they well, actually right. do. It's crazy. <laughs> And I had some good stuff, you know, I wouldn't compare, I wouldn't put it next to like, you know, Bordeaux or Napa or anything like that, but there's some really drinkable stuff out there and some fun spots to just, you know, <laughs> hang out for an afternoon. And it's, yeah, it's kind of cool what you come up with. It's, it's wild. I think we've had wines in yeah. t 28 states now, at least. So wow, yeah, that's awesome. yeah. And definitely that's not cool. all winners, yeah. but you know. <laughs> Oh, drinkable yeah, exactly yeah, which is what every them, winery strives for drinkable like, <laughs> maybe not so drinkable but we'll, uh, yeah. but yeah there's there's stuff for everybody and it's just it's fun you know it's it's really cool to see how the industry's really grown i think there's wine in all 50 states at this point um so it's mm -hmm. kind of it's cool it's a cool thing yeah i really want to try an alaska wine i, I just would don't know too. So. yeah I, i'd be really curious to try there's a lot of wines i'd still like to try like i'd love to try i haven't had any arizona wine i'd love that for that's like taken off so i'd like to try that but yeah there's a lot of stuff yeah, so people when and some of my studies like i'm trying to wrap up this wset diploma nice. soon um and it, it always boggles my mind we just i just did some of the sparkling and they're like the english wine it's you know very short growing season but you know since we were, english wine there's a lot of examples of this but short growing season but since they are higher latitude the amount of sun hours they get that always boggles my mind That's so right. when i first thought of alaska i was like Oh, there's, there's summer's way too short, but it's like, well, when it's sunny, you know, 18 hours a day and right. you can pump up the yeah. you know, sugars, you're good to go. Yeah, it's crazy. Um, it's crazy. 
Yeah. But speaking of a colder place <laughs> that grows grapes, um, <laughs> Michigan, yeah. you work on a winery there. Tell us a little bit about your work up there oh in gosh. the producer you work with. Yeah, I worked with a lot up there. Um, so it's mostly in Southwest Michigan. So Michigan's got, I think, five AVAs now. Um, and oh, wow. the three oh, wow. kind of big, well, four kind of biggest ones are two of them are in the Southwest corner of the state. And then two are a little bit further north up in the Traverse City area. Um, vastly different from each other, um, but just a, a really cool place that I think is going to be on the forefront, just given climate change, like they're positioned really well, kind of like the UK, like you said, like they're kind of in that same kind of their climate change is going to benefit the vines there. Um, but I got involved there. I started, you know, same thing, kind of traveling up there just in the backyard for Chicago and summers we'd spend, you know, doing wine tours and visiting all the wineries and just kind of camping up there. The beach is right there. So it's great. And, uh, and I got to know a winemaker, this has been about five years ago, another Airbnb to like Airbnb, I should thank Airbnb, um, stayed at an Airbnb property, the guy had a winery. And, uh, and so we started talking, hit it off. And he's actually the one that got me in all my WSET programs and it kind of became my mentor. Um, and I ended up doing three harvests with him. And uh, so that was amazing. And then after that, I uh, started working with the wine trail itself to pr produce a video talking about the area itself and, and really digging into the geology and the terroir and everything that, that it has going on. Um, and then started working with another winery after that that had uh, has a vineyard and a winery. So I did two full growing seasons on the vineyard in the cellar and it helped to make some wines and it was it's amazing and it's it was just cool to be a part of that process and see how everything actually works and like get it to be hands-on and because it's one thing to i think you know read it in a book like i can memorize stuff but then to actually see it and touch it and do it it's like okay now i get it like now that makes sense um so it really helped to kind of connect the dots and uh, and michigan southwest michigan's pretty cool it's i, I really think it's going to be you know, I always say it's kind of like the Finger Lakes about 15, 20 years ago. Like it's got the potential. Mm. Um, there's only about 20 wineries there right now, but there's a lot of new growers coming in. There's a lot of new young winemakers coming in. So I think you're going to start to see it kind of pick up over the next, you know, decade or two. It always takes a takes a while, but I think it's on its way. What are they growing up there? Is it mostly hybrids or are there, is there vinifera too? Mostly or? vinifera. Um, there's mm. there some hybrids, but the places I was at, it's all vinifera. Um, Pinot Noir, Chardonnay, Pinot Gris, uh, a lot of Bordeaux blends, so Cab Sauv, Cab Franc, see more low up there, um, Syrah, there's some Marsan Roussan. I mean, it's, you can really, you can find a lot of um, vinifera up there. Further up north in the Travers area, you see a lot more Riesling, a lot more kind of Alsatian style wines. Um, some great sparkling wines, traditional method, a lot of that happening. Um, but then some hybrids too, you for sure have those. You'll have Marquette and Marichal Foch and uh, Saval and, you know, Vignoles and a couple of those. So a little more of the, the cold hardy varieties. But uh, but I think you're seeing a move more towards the vinifera because it's working and a lot of more organic and a lot of more working towards, you know, sustainability and it's, and it's actually working and you're seeing it work. Um, so I think it'll be kind of a cool thing over the next few years. Do you have any? Do you have a sense of how, like, what the how the approach differs in terms of uh, marketing emerging wines out of regions like that versus you know some of the established places? Yeah, it's um, like what, what's the approach that you take? You know, getting someone to put a Michigan wine on their table, for instance. Yeah, it's tough. It's not you know, it's definitely not easy. And one of the hard parts is that the quant like the quantity that they have to put out there just isn't you know as much as it might be from some of the bigger areas. So the stuff that sure. they're making, they want to sell in their tasting room because you know they do sell out in the tasting rooms. Um, the tasting rooms are hopping in the summer times, especially, and so they end up selling out, and so they don't have a lot to distribute. So it's mostly, I would say at this point, it's a lot of promoting the tourism of the region to get people there. Um, and for a region like Michigan, like I said, it's in Chicago's backyard. So it's really, you know, trying to bring awareness to Chicago, um, as well as Indianapolis and Detroit, because they're all kind of within that area, you know, that can easily get up there and spend the weekend or spend a week in the summer. So it's a lot of, you know, tourism promotions at this point, I think, to kind of get people familiar with the region. But then you are starting to see some of the producers, um, the one I was just at for the last two years, that are focusing only on distribution. So right now they don't have a tasting room. Uh, they will at some point, but they're focusing heavily on distribution in Chicago. So you're starting to see some of it, you know, really kind of, you know, start to push to market, which is kind of cool. 
Um, but it's a challenge because it's, you know, they're unknown regions and especially, you know, you, you get people that are used to drinking, you know, from the bigger places that they know. And it's, it's a different style of wine. You know, this isn't, it's when you get a Cabernet from Michigan, it's not like a Cabernet from, you know, California or Bordeaux. It's, it's Michigan. Um, it's high quality, you know, some of them, <laughs> there's a lot of, there's a lot of, you know, it like anywhere, there's some, some variance in quality, but the, the ability to make a high quality wine is there. Um, and it's, it's more of a cool climate. So you're going to get the higher acids. You're going to get those more fresh fruit forward flavors. Um, so it's, you know, it's kind of, it, it's an education process, like anything else, you know, why it's like, you know, this is, you can't, it's not, it's apples and oranges. You can't compare one region to the other. It's always going to be different. Um, you can assess quality. You can assess, you know, is it made in the right way? Does it have balance? Does it have structure? Does it, you know, that kind of stuff, but you can't compare it to, to other regions. You got to kind of evaluate it on its own. So it's more of a challenge, I yeah. think, um, cause it does require a bit of education and, you know, kind of a, a big ask of people to kind of, you know, trust me on this wine because, you know, I, I can't tell you the amount of times I've been like laughed at because I like Michigan wine. Like, oh, yeah, Michigan. I'm like, no, for real, like, you really got to try this. Yeah, like, yeah. open up to it. It's really, you know, there's some good stuff. Um, but I think when people are open and keep an open mind, I think they start to realize like, okay, there's, there's actually something happening. And that's true of any emerging region. Like, you're going to have those hiccups when they first start out because they're learning, you know, and you look at Napa, that's really, they only just started really in the sixties and seventies, right? Like that's not that long ago. So, you know, for these newer regions that are just starting up, it's, you know, they're not too late to the game. They they're just, you know, it takes a little while. So and I think just have to have an open mind with it. That makes a lot of sense. So are you seeing when they are distributed, more like specialty wine shops or is it hospitality first? Like where are they getting their foot in the door? Yeah, this uh, particular winery is at Stranger Wine Company. They got their foot in the door um, through a natural wine distributor here in Chicago. And so they were in, I want to say, hmm. don't quote me on this, but maybe 25 different restaurants. So mostly on premise, um, which I think hmm. is the way to go initially, just because on premise, then, you know, the people selling the wine have the ability to tell the yeah. story, which is, you know, once that starts rolling, you know, builds momentum. And then I think it's easier to move into the off-premise stuff. Um, but yeah, it's, it's sold out there. You know, the pallets are moving. It, it seemed to seem to go really well. Cause it's, you're able to sell that local angle too, that this is, you know, it's something that's local to us and, you know, it's not, you know, it has that sustainability aspect. It has, you know, it's in our backyard, which is kind of cool. So it's got a lot of, a lot of story to tell, which is kind of interesting too. Nice. I think a lot of us in the wine industry would love people to, uh, build more relationships with their local wine merchants and their shops, yeah. their boutique shops, yes. and to get recommendations from those places and to buy wines, maybe yeah. from smaller portfolios out of those places. How do you see like relationship of maybe like a wine content and media team like Vino had, uh, what role do they play alongside maybe like the desire for people to also be getting those recommendations yeah. that you might give from their local oh, shops. Sure. Yeah, right now we have, so every wine that we list in the newsletter that we review, we have an affiliate link where you can actually buy that wine. Um, and it's always, it's typically local shops. So k &L Merchants out in yeah. the West Coast, um, Mr. D's in Florida. So it's all like local spots that we'll refer to. Um, cool. you know, I, you know, down the line, you know, maybe you'll see a vino head sticker in a, you know, in a wine shop that, you know, has a vino head approved kind of thing. Who knows? Um, no point numbers, but you know, approved by vino head, sure. you never know. <laughs> but I think there's definitely a way to do that. Cause that's, I mean, that's how we find a lot of the wines that we're reviewing is we're, you know, going to our local shops and taking recommendations and, or if we're at the restaurant, you know, we, you know, talk to the psalms and figure out, okay, what's, you know, what's new, what's going to pique our interest. And, you know, we ask questions all the time and it's, it's kind of cool. And I always tell people that, so like, you know, oh, how, what wine should I pick? I still get overwhelmed. You know, you walk into one of those big box stores and I'm like, oh my God, I don't know what, like, I don't even know where to start. I've, I've been in this a while. It's overwhelming. And so I think you just have to ask questions, you know, and even the pros ask questions because there's always something new, you know, there's, it's just, and that's the cool thing about it. It's a rabbit hole. Like there is always something new and it's, it's a fun part about it. Oh yeah. Yeah. You always ask questions. The questions may change, but yeah. there's always more questions that you're going to have. Exactly. That's fun. And I, I always, the more I've learned about wine, the more, the more questions you end up having, yeah. actually, you feel yeah. like you go through a little phase where you think, you know, or you're like, oh no, I got it all. And then you're like, oh, <laughs> yeah, no, that yeah, was, that was horrible. Yeah. nothing. Exactly. <laughs> like, and even, like, Extremely like, short phase. Right? Yeah. yeah, exactly. yeah super <laughs> short. And even look at like the masters of wine, like even they don't know everything, you know, they know a lot more than me. 
but like I feel like everybody kind of has their niche too and what they're interested in and there's so many different things you can be interested in everything from like you mentioned the labels on the, the wine bottles you can be focused on that you can be you know, really geeking out about the yeasts in the wine or you know sustainable viticulture or maybe it's the history or the you know family story like there's so many pieces that i think you know if you're into into wine and you know have an interest in it there's so many different paths you can take that it's just really kind of cool i mean it's it's just a never ending and every and so you can kind of focus on you know the things that you enjoy maybe kind of specialize in that be good at that and be you know kind of an expert in that area but you're not going to know everything it's just it's impossible <laughs> yeah well you're uh you go on brady i'll Change. Well, I was uh, I was gonna go into maybe some uh, talking about more of some of your like current interests um, in wine right now and just uh, I know you obviously write a lot about what you're drinking yeah um, but wanted maybe <laughs> to talk a little bit about what sort of like what's in your fridge right now what are you drinking on a Tuesday kind of um, what sorts of things are yeah you're really excited about awesome in my fridge right now there's almost nothing because I'm moving so everything is already gone like I shipped all the wine it was like it was terrifying watching the wine leave the house I was like oh my god my babies <laughs> please um, but I would say most often I always have some kind of sparkling in my fridge like always um, I, I do love champagne that's kind of my my thing um, especially grower champagne. I'm getting really into that the last couple of years. So I've always got some of that laying around and, um, but really any kind of sparkling, um, traditional method sparkling, I, I have around a lot. Um, Tuesday night wines. Oh, that's all over the place. Um, I, I will really drink almost anything. I tend to lean to, more towards cool climate. I like higher acidity wines. Cabernet Franc. I, I always say Cabernet Franc is my boyfriend. That's my my grape. Um, I, I just love Cab Franc, like in all its forms. It's it's been my kind of the one I fell in love with when I first got into wine, and it's still my favorite. So there's there's always some of that around. Um, I don't know. I like exploring lots of lots of different wines, but it, it's been an interesting. You know, even in the last ten years, I've switched from when I first started getting into wine, I really only liked reds. Like I really, I wouldn't touch white wines. I didn't, I didn't care for them. And it's now kind of, I think I drink more whites than reds at this point. Um, so I've kind of flipped a little bit, which is interesting. So I think like, you know, your taste just kind of changes over time and, and it, I'm sure it'll change again. And what I'm drinking, you know, today might not be what I like tomorrow. And it's, that's kind of, it's interesting, but I would say cool yeah. climates. Um, I like, you know, I tend to like wines that aren't too heavy in alcohol. Like I like the 13% range or that's kind of where I like to fall. Anything more than that, it's, like, whew, it's a, bit, a bit much for me at times, unless I'm having a big meal with it. Especially um, a Tuesday. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah, I, I got to get up and work. <laughs> it's like, not great. Um, but yeah, I would say, you know, kind of sparkling wines are more my everyday kind of obsession lately. And it's uh, it's been a lot of fun yeah. to kind of get into those. Yeah. Go ahead. I was going to say I agree. Also, we have a <laughs> a, a recommendation for um, the equivalent, I guess, of a Grewer Champagne okay. um, in the Willamette Valley. One ooh, of our ooh. our buddies oh, over yeah, at Gran right. Granville. Um, so yeah, he's basically making. We 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 can chat about it more, but he's okay. basically making like very small lots, and he makes a Blanc de Blanc. He just came out with a awesome. Blanc de Noir. Was it Brady or was yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Blanc yeah. de Noir. Okay. But they're super cool. I I believe he's had the Blanc de Noir for a little while, and the Blanc de Blanc yeah. is the current okay. is the new thing. Right. Yeah, that's super neat, but I'm traditional, in. In. nice lease time. <laughs> yeah, send me the details. But, uh, I'll be there. <laughs> yeah, well, we'll use that then as a transition. So you're yeah. moving to the Willamette Valley. Yeah. What spurred this, and what are you going to be? Where are you going to be? Um, I am going to be smack in the heart of Willamette and McMinnville, so I will be like nice. right in the center of oh, it all. Nice. Um, which is, it boggles my mind. So like I Googled wineries when I was there and it was like 700 and I was just like, oh yeah. my God, like what? This is amazing. So, you know, I'm going from like, you know, Michigan where I've got 20 that I work with. I'm like, there's 700 wineries. Um, so this, it was actually, uh, my husband's job has taken us out there and he's not in wine. It's completely unrelated. <laughs> um, so he was in a national job search and this was the one that came up. And so it was just kind of you know, synchronicity. I'm like, this is amazing. Like I get to be in wine country you can do your thing um so you know vino head i can do from anywhere in the country um we're headquartered in la but like i said our writers are kind of scattered everywhere um so i'll still be working on that um obviously won't be at the vineyard in michigan anymore so i'll be missing missing michigan but there's you know a few a few other vineyards out there that i can check out if i want to um 
yeah, I'll be teaching, I'll be writing, I'll be kind of just doing everything I do here, just taking it to a new location. So I'm excited. I'm excited. You'll be t- 22 minutes from our friends at Granville. Excellent. Um, so <laughs> okay. That, that might be the first place I go. That's, <laughs> okay, here we go. That's better well, than the 42 hours that I am from them. So. <laughs> because I don't think my wine will yeah. get there before I do, so I might need to fix them up. <laughs> Well, McMinnville is like the best spot because oh, you're awesome. you're basically yeah. an hour radius to anything, including back up to Portland, yep. back to the bottom of the valley. Like, oh, it's a nice spot. Yeah, it's incredible. So. Yeah, to the ocean. Like, this is all like you know, coming from the middle of the country to me, this is like this is amazing. It's like, oh my god, we can see the ocean in forty five minutes. It's insane. Yeah. So it should be pretty cool. I'm excited. I'm excited and just yeah. excited to dive into the wines there. I haven't this, the inner job interview was the first trip I had ever made out there, so it was I haven't really explore the Willamette at all so I'm, I'm excited to to really kind of dig in and get to know it and, uh, yeah even even portland there's a really cool wine scene overall some of the, some of the bars and shops yeah i'm excited yeah I'm we excited. we go like once a year at least okay. last year was a couple times awesome. it's super dandy yeah there's always something awesome. new to all new right. to find we well, have to look me up on there now <laughs> uh, yeah that's right yeah. Hopefully I'll um, some good spots better. so you're teaching how did you get into teaching because that's always something i've been interested in down the line personally, um, but also just what, what levels do you teach? Yeah. How do you get into it? Well, yeah. So I got it. It was another Instagram connection, which seems to be kind of how everything, everything in my life happens. Um, I met the owner of a wine school here in Chicago. We happened to be at a lunch together and um, I had taken, I've gotten through level three, started diploma and decided I, I just do not have the time or headspace for that. So maybe sometime down the line, but not right now, um, but I can teach level with having le- level three. You can teach levels one and two. Um, mm-hmm. I prefer to just do level one. Um, I love it. It's mostly consumers. It's mostly you know non career oriented people that just are curious about wine, which is kind of my my sweet spot. That's the um, best. Yeah, and I just love I love those classes. You know, there's people on dates. There's people you know they're for girls' night or they're with their buddies and you know or people that are just curious <laughs> and and you just get these. It, it fuels my excitement even more because it's, you know, after you're doing this for a while, you can, it's easy to lose sight. I think of why you're doing it. You just kind of get into it, but then you go to these classes and it's like, Oh, they're just as excited. You know, like you see their excitement. It's like, yes, that's, you know, that's why I got into wine. That's why I'm still here. And so it's just so much fun to go through that class. And it's really, you know, it's basic entry level wine info. Like here's how you make wine. It's very macro level kind of stuff. Um, but it's a blast. And I, and I think, I think teaching level one is an opportunity to start to break down some of those barriers, like to, to get people less afraid to, to talk about it and to have conversations and say what they like and don't like. And, and just kind of, you know, it's an opportunity to share and say, you know, this doesn't have to be scary and we're all learning. We're all have questions. You know, I, you know, I'm the same boat as you, I started there and I'm over here and I'm still asking questions and I still get <laughs> things wrong. And I, you know, so it's, it really kind of opens up those conversations and it's just a blast. Um, and then there's the food and wine pairing lab with level one. That's always awesome. That's the only level that has that. So. Oh, I forgot about that. Yeah. 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 yeah which is always my I, favorite thing. I <laughs> skipped that, but, um, I had a, one of the guys who, um, was teaching my level three was like bragging about how he would always give everybody like hot Cheetos and like <laughs> the highest alcohol red wine yes. he could find just yes. to like show them. The yep. It's like, Oh, it's hilarious. The reaction. Oh yeah. It's, it's awesome. It's awesome. <laughs> I do like a hot, uh, what is it? Like a hot tapito sauce or something. It's like a hot salsa sauce. Um, and it's super spicy. And then I usually do either like a high alcohol <laughs> Zin or high alcohol Shiraz. And I, I do it with them. It's, it's, I'm like, you don't have to do this by yourself. I will do it too. But the watching faces is just priceless. Like, yeah, I bet, I bet you would never do that with a Cab Franc. You're willing yeah, to ruin exactly. Zin. But you... <laughs> exactly. I'm not doing it with a good, yeah, I'm not with a good bottle. So, <laughs> and this is like, you know, the really heavy, heavy, jammy, high burning sensation. Yeah, it's great, but it's it's so much fun. I actually had a guy once on, um, I was teaching virtually during the pandemic. And so they had to bring their own supplies for that one. So he had uh, had some hot salsa and we're doing the exercise. And he took a spoonful of the hot salsa and I was like, oh, no. I'm like, no, just like, I don't have a chip, just like a nap. Like, well, he was on fire. He left the camera. I'm like, yeah, he's not going to be back for a while. <laughs> That was not good. So now nice. I have to like preface everything and say like, do not take a spoonful. Just take a little dab on your chip or on your hand, like whatever you want to do, but do not do a spoonful. <laughs> it's, 
but it's a, uh, just a ton of fun and everybody it's cool too because you get to see like those aha moments for people or like you yeah. know it's because it's you know you're learning kind of why things work and why they don't work it's not you know you're not getting too granular of like you know recipe kind of stuff like you know here's why hot salsa and high alcohol don't work you know so you talk about that stuff and you get to see their aha moments like oh okay yeah and like again it breaks down those barriers like it doesn't have to be that complicated it's you know wine is supposed to go with food it's meant to you know be with meals so wine's not really the problem it's more our foods that are you know that's where we kind of complicate things so it's uh, it's yeah. fun to do those classes how, i just love it how did, how did you how did you end up um on the w set track versus cms or something else was it Never really a thought that you would do CMS or? Yeah, never really a thought. Um, the guy I was working for in Michigan, he was, um, he had the W set classes at the winery. And so that's where I took one and two. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, for me, it's, I, I wasn't interested in the service side. Like I knew that wasn't something I wanted to do. <clears throat> for me, it's more the kind of the business side or the education side, marketing side, um, you know, writing side. So I think for me, the W set just kind of fit better. Um, cause I, I, am not ever going to serve a table. I would be terrible at that. <laughs> no one wants me doing that. I can happily talk to people at a table, but you don't want me serving anyone because it will be a mess. <laughs> so, yeah. so I think that was kind of why I never really went that route. Um, but yeah, there's so many education opportunities out there from, you know, the certified wine specialists and CMS and W set and wine scholar guild. I mean, there's so many opportunities out there. And then programs too, um, in uh, McMinnville where we're going, but my husband's job's at uh, Linfield University and they actually have a wine and viticulture program there. So that's kind of cool too. Like you can, mm. you know, career track yourself right away. But uh, I wish I had known that at 18, I would have, my life might have lined up a little yeah. bit differently, but you know. <laughs> oh yeah. No, I'm with you. I decided to like, uh, I got into wine when I was 20. Six, I guess, after awesome. watching Psalm, Psalm yeah. for like the millionth time. Yep. So, yeah. So all I did was like, I was like, oh, I wonder how people do this. And I just signed up for an exam and like, I didn't drink wine. So I just like wow. read the wine Bible and yeah. took the exam like three months later. Holy and I was like, oh, wow. this is fun. Wow. And then, well, and then I got hooked. So then I took the certified Psalm exam like a month and a half later and randomly passed that. So I was like, hmm. Maybe I should awesome. go into wine as a nice, career. <laughs> nice, nice. Um, now, do you want to go on yeah. to the MW after your diploma, or is diploma kind of the? Yeah, okay. that would be the that's awesome. the ultimate goal. So we'll awesome. we will see. Um, I'm knocking on wood. Hopefully, get my positive results. And then now that we have um, uh, my boss here now is an MW. Yeah. So my biggest concern was how to get a recommendation from an MW. So if Adam <laughs> doesn't know, give yeah. me one, yeah, stay on good behavior. I'm gonna, uh, I'll, one. I'll quit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But um, I was going to ask earlier, I don't want our audience to think they're stupid questions, but what are yeah. some of the funnier questions you've gotten during your classes about yeah. like, yeah, and know, that's just it. oranges there's, and orange wine? Or... Yeah. And like, there's no bad questions, right? Like, that's just it. There's, right. I mean, it's, I have, don't I, know what you don't know. I, I had somebody yeah. ask what the difference between Sauvignon Blanc and Cabernet Sauvignon was. And like, it, it was an honest question, like honestly didn't know. And like, you know, we can kind of laugh at it, but it's, if you don't know, you don't know. And it, you know, it was like, okay, yeah, here, it's a red grape and a white grape. Those are the two biggest differences. Like, you know, it can be as basic as that. Um, and then I'll get, you know, other questions. You always get the, you know, the headaches and sulfites question. That's always a fun one. Um, and then I get a lot of questions about what is natural wine. You get that a lot lately. Um, which isn't a bad, you know, it's not a bad question. It's just a complicated answer because that, you know, there is no standard, there's no category, there's nothing defining that specifically. So it's so vague. Um, do you, do you, um, do you hand out those little droppers that reduce tannins? No, uh, -uh. In the no, <laughs> I, I saw that <laughs> no. in the store the other day. Yeah. It was like a little, uh, yeah, no. little, uh, no. like dropper and it says tannin reducer. Yeah, no. What, what is it? Just like sugar or like, I don't, I don't know proteins? Really yeah. like it just finds the wine in the glass. Apparently. Yeah. I was thinking about just buying the whole like case of it off the shelf and throwing it out on the way yeah, out like, the door no. so that no one else bought it. No, like, no. <laughs> Like you want minimal intervention wines on one hand, but then you're going to add something to it. Like, no, yeah, that's right. don't do it. No, it's just, uh, yeah, I always just tell people, get, you know, have a glass of water. Make sure you're having a lot of water. That's, that's <laughs> like, just hydrate because it is dehydrating. That's, you know, there's your headaches. It dehydrates you easily. So yeah, just drink some water. Um, but yeah, I think those were probably the, the you know, kind of wildest question, you know, most basic questions. Um, but there's always, you know, it's always something because it's just, and, I, and that was interesting too. I feel like the more, 
wine education we take on the, you know, the career track route, you kind of like, you're surrounded by people that know as much as you do, right? You're studying the same stuff. So you're, you know, your bubble kind of becomes other people that know wine and you forget that the majority of people out there, it's not what they do. It's not what they know. They, you know, it's, they know what's at the grocery store. They know, you know, what they had at a friend's house. That's it, but that's it. And they don't, and they shouldn't know anymore. Why do they have to? It's not their job. Right. Mm -hmm. So I think it's, you know, it's kind of remembering that like, you know, oh yeah, this is, this is what I do. I, this is why I know this, but you know, other people just, you know, they don't. And so I think that's where the recommendations come in too, because not everybody wants to study this stuff, you know, we're we're the crazy ones that love it. And it's, you know, it's (laughs) our thing and it's it's not everybody else's thing. And they just want to know, like, tell me what I should buy and why. (laughs) <laughs> you know, I don't want to, I don't yeah. know about the yeast. I don't care. Like, just give me the, <laughs> tell me what bottle I need. Um, it's interesting on, on our, on our side of the business. Cause like, cause we're an investment company. We have folks who come to us strictly because they were into the investment thing yeah. and the finance. And we have people who come in because they were really interested in wine. And so the, the, the spectrum of oh, understanding yeah. about wine, it's really fun to interact with clients who. Oh, totally. like I actually had someone uh, the other day, I think maybe listen to the podcast. So we'll, we'll recognize this. Um, but was saying that, uh, he actually started getting more into wine from following some of our content and being invested with us, which is really great because, you know, we don't think of ourselves as a wine company primarily, right. but it's always really cool for, you know, obviously Billy and I, who are into wine yeah. outside of just investing to hear that folks have you know, yeah. come to it in that place. Yeah. And that's a great example. Yeah. Like I, you know, yeah, I can tell you a lot of things about wine, but ask me anything about investments. Forget it. Like I'm, <laughs> you know, that's why I go to invest, you know, yeah. people to help me with that stuff. So it's the same kind of thing. Like not everybody's going to know or care to know what we know and that's okay. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So looking forward into 2023, uh, what are you excited about on a wine side? What are you going to be getting into? Yeah. yeah. Oh, it's on the radar. Question. Um, obviously while I'm at Valley, I'll be definitely diving into that. Um, I, for me, I'm actually, I want to go back and it's kind of my goal for this year is to start taking Spanish classes again. Um, so I took a lot nice. through school and uh, was recently in Argentina on a wine trip and that something just clicked and it was like, no, this is, this is what I need to be doing. So somehow or another, I don't know what it looks like yet. Um, I want to pick up my Spanish again and then figure out how to roll Argentina wines into what I do. Um, I have no idea what it looks like. I don't know if that's, you know making wine eventually i don't know if it's importing i have no idea but i know that that's kind of the direction i want to kind of work my way towards which so i'll be working on that this year and yeah just kind of all my usual projects and and writing and teaching and all that stuff so it's always exciting it's and it's interesting because i i feel like i always have kind of goals like that but they're not really defined um Mm -hmm. they're they're more like intentions of areas i want to go and then it it just kind of tends to work out you know because i can't I couldn't have planned this career. There's no way I could have planned this path at all. Um, but I think if you're on the path that you know you're supposed to be on, that you're excited about it, you love it, it you, you naturally work hard because of it. It's always a hustle, right? So, you know, as long as you're doing those things, I think opportunities, you know, you put yourself in line to find opportunities that'll kind of line up with what you want. So, so it's more intentions, I think, than, than specific goals. So. So we'll see, you know, mm-hmm. maybe I'll end up in Spain and not Argentina. I have no idea, <laughs> but I am going you should, Spanish. You should, de- you should design, you should design the Duolingo for wine oh, there because we go. like my, my wine French is terrible and my wine German there is even go. worse. You know, it's really um, And so like, it would be, it would be good. To, yeah. It would be good that to have, a- I can barely pronounce a lot of the producer's names in Napa. Oh gosh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. My, so, my French so producer's like, name, I forget that. But what's really funny yeah, is my but husband bought me for wine- Christmas uh, a book about like a, a wine 101 book in Spanish. She's like, for you to practice your Spanish. So it's like, you know, it's all wine stuff I know, but it's in Spanish. I'm like, this is awesome. So, so maybe I'll do that. Yeah. I'll just do wine duel lingo. Yeah. I like it. I'll be your first customer. I like it. Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. <laughs> you never know. Never know. Very cool. I think that's great. Um, yeah, well, I mean, definitely have to get out there to Willamette. I mean, yeah, any yes. other uh, reasons for me to come out are uh, Perfect. are welcome because, like you said, it is beautiful. Yeah, and you have some um, details for that sparkling wine place. I would love to get out there. It'd be awesome. For sure, yeah. To have some recommendations. Um, I wanted to go back because I thought the stuff you were saying about Michigan was really cool. And so yeah. to kind of wrap up here, maybe we can touch a few other places because you said that you've tasted in so many different states. Yeah. 
Um, I, Billy and I might both like to hear if you've tasted in Vermont. I'd really like to hear how much you've tasted in Maryland and Virginia. Well, Billy's from Virginia too. Nice, awesome. But um, awesome. yeah, any of those three places, does something stand out to you? Or... Yeah, Vermont. Um, been there a couple times for wine. Um, and it, that was the first place I had a couple hybrids, Marquette and Marichal Foch, which they do in Michigan too. Um, do you know David Keck? Uh, no. Uh-uh. Uh-uh. Weird. I didn't know people could drink wine in Vermont and not know him. He's an NMS making wine up there. Oh, wow. But he's like, there's like, he's like, there's, 40 total acres or whatever. There's okay. just whatever small amount of wine. So that's crazy. That's All right. Nice. Anyway, go yeah, on. I want to hear does he make yeah. cider too? Is that right, Billy? Or I think he cider? took, uh, I think they're planting where cider once lived uh, okay. or grow, grew. Nice. I want to say Loved. it was most, I mean, it was probably 10 years ago that I was there. Um, and it was mostly hybrids at the time, but I would say they were some of the best hybrid wines I've had. I mean, they were, they, hmm. they were done well. Um, so yeah, Ver- Vermont was super exciting. Uh, Virginia, nice. I was there two summers ago, um, and did a bunch of the wineries there. And it's, I, I think Virginia's pretty cool. Um, they have good Cab Franc. Oh, they do. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But, yeah. That's yeah, why I still have a lot of yep. that. <laughs> <laughs> I get a lot of their Cab Franc and their Bordeaux blends. I think were really cool too. Um, it's an interesting spot. It was, it was a cool trip. Um, I think what other one did Maryland? I have not had any wines from Maryland. Not yet. That'll be, nice. that'll be one. Do you like, too. um, Long Island Cab Franc, and they're known for it. I've only had a couple. In I've my only life. had a couple too. Yeah, oh. I, Finger Lakes was kind of where I would always just stop, and I that's you know it's my home away from home, so I just kind of focus on that. Um, but I've had a couple, and they were I really like their Cab Franc too. I was like, all right, I have to check that part of the state out if I can if I can make it past the Finger Lakes one day, maybe. <laughs> I tend to get stuck can, there. Can, can you can you explain for listeners what a hybrid is, and also yeah. kind of halfway for me because I, I do understand some, but probably not all. Yeah, so a hybrid is. You can jump in here too, Billy, because I have not touched hybrids in a while. But basically, Vitis vinifera are the kind of the winemaking grapes that are naturally occurring. Um, and they they also cross. So like, you know, Cabernet Sauvignon is a cross between Cabernet Franc and Sauvignon Blanc. And that happened in the wild. So it's kind of a natural hybrid, but it's still Vitis vinifera. Mm-hmm. It's all natural. Um, the hybrids we're talking about, a lot of times you get French hi- American hybrids, American hybrids. So they're crossing... Um, non-wine grape varieties with wine grape varieties is that kind of on is that track billy kind kind of they're, they're basically just like different species yeah. so technically they are american varieties of grapes like labrusca riparia yep. some other ones that can produce grapes and they have been made into wine but they're they just have distinct <laughs> um yeah, they're just not oh, so, very good so like, like, foxy like, ones. Con- like concord in the like mid-atlantic or the south yeah. maybe yeah. something like that yeah. okay and, and they'll They'll cross them to basically um, get all of the features, like some that can grow in the Northeast and they're really they're hardy, hardy and, and they're yeah. cold. Yeah. 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 So okay. they pick like the pieces they want from certain ones. And then they develop a lot of them um, at Cornell. Um, a bunch are developed mm-hmm. it um, out in Minnesota. Minnesota yeah. too. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so they'll, you know, genetically engineer different hybrids to, you know, fit with those yeah. things that we need, you know, drought resistant, cold hardy, that kind of stuff. Um, so yeah. It's, it's interesting. And there's, Brady would have appreciated. Oh, sorry, I didn't mean to jump no, in, no. but I did have a Minnesota. I did have a Minnesota wine last weekend. Nice. What'd you uh, have? That was oh, that nice. was pretty cool. Of one of these these hybrids, nice. so that was neat. Awesome. Was it a front neck um, by chance? Uh, no, okay. it was not. I actually like front neck. My okay. my another long story. My brother used to date someone who lives in Ohio and makes wine, and she gives a lot of random things. Nice. Awesome. Um, but one random note, just for our listeners, on the finish off on the nerdy side. Um, Crossings are Vitis vinifera with Vitis vinifera. Hybrids are Vitis vinifera with other species. Yeah. So okay. just so you know. Those, yeah, because yeah, you can cross like it, um, Pinotage. That's like a cross between two. Cinso and yeah, Pinot Noir. Vinifera. Yeah. So it's it's a cross. It's not a hybrid. Um, yeah, good point. Good point. So are most of, are most of the... Um, uh, I'm just trying to think like, um, like Syrah. Is that a single kind of Venus vinifera or was it originally like two different Venus viniferi? Good question. <laughs> I don't know about Syrah. Syrah or just like a, any of uh, Sir, Syrah that example. Is is a, no, it's a, in more of an ancient like, yeah, varietal yeah. and from okay. from like actually the Rhone. They they have a hard time finding its DNA, but like Jansis and um this guy named Vuillemoge, they basically have a book that's called yep. Wine Grapes. It's like a thousand grapes and they've done DNA tracking. So you can see mm. the parentage of like most grapes. Yeah. Yeah, Almost all wild. of them are, yeah. Yeah, it's so cool. Yeah. But 
Yeah, and then you got everything is from something else. And- there's all kinds sure, of stuff, yeah. you know, because then you've got all Mutation. these, you know, different Pinot Noir clones, different Chardonnay clones, and it's the same plant, but different, you know, DNA, slightly different DNA. So it's, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. it gets complicated and wild, but, but it's cool. Yeah. It's Almost all grapes we have are natural crossings, like the, yeah. the, the old French grapes and some other ones. There's very few that are ancient that are like very at the top. Yeah. And a sure. lot of times, I yeah. mean, when you look at the old, like old vineyards way back when, everything was just kind of planted wild and all out there so like you know vine by vine could be a different grape variety um doesn't look you know didn't look like it does today where you've got you know rows of pinot noir rows of cab sauv like they were all just you know Mm -hmm. mixed together and so a lot of times you didn't even know what it was um and that's why they're still discovering so many different varieties and regions you know in old world regions still too was it like um i I guess like maybe like a certico um is one that uh like is ancient and hasn't been crossed naturally before i don't yeah. know if like we have that r- knowledge readily available yeah but um i just remember when we were on santorini they were saying that you know ob- it wasn't affected by flocks for obviously because it was like out on the island and um that it i'm pretty sure it was there when folks came but i could be wrong about that that's what yeah that's what um, i heard when i was there too i was just trying yeah. to rack my mind for some, yeah, something that maybe been fit that for a while yeah it's yeah it's amazing how old some of these can be it's incredible and just the yeah. varieties yeah. that are still popping up and then the ones that are you know long extinct too because there's i'm sure many that have disappeared and then there'll be new ones oh yeah if you ever want to go way down the wine rabbit hole i'm only like halfway through the book but the story of wine by hugh johnson it starts in like many millennia bc and kind of brings up like how wines evolved through time and as it was part of culture but he talks about so many varieties that were written down and they're like we have no idea what this was or this definitely doesn't exist anymore yeah but (laughs) made great wine (laughs) yeah and like in the old text there's no cabernet sauvignon like that didn't come around until much later so it's wild Mm. to think about now it's like the most one of the most well-known certainly most planted grape and it's that's kind of wild oh yeah like that's relatively new in wine history you know and now it's the king, so that's kind of yeah. it's wild. Yeah. Well, this is great. I thought I think we uh, we touched a lot of stuff that's really good for kind of casual uh, wine consumers and it's and new good. folks, but also yeah. maybe some nerdy yeah. stuff as well. <laughs> um, so yeah, definitely appre- appreciate your uh, knowledge and insight, and kind of um, I I definitely got some things to look out for. Um, so I'll be. Uh, googling michigan wines nice. that ship to maryland nice. there you go there you go i can give you a few i can give you a few i know to do so, nice. yeah that'd be awesome yeah and we'll send you some notes we'll send you some notes on willamette too and awesome. uh, get you connected with some of our friends perfect yeah perfect now this is great this is great and then real quick on vino head i forgot to mention um people can sign up mm-hmm. for that um on oh, the sure. website yeah. and it, it is free so Good thing to note about the newsletter. It is free. So it's just a, a sign up online. Yeah. We'll, dro- we'll, dro- we'll drop some links in the show notes cool. too and in the YouTube description and stuff. And so we'll make sure that, um, yeah, people can find you guys awesome. easily. Yeah. Um, and if anybody's out always in LA, great content. We're hosting a bunch of social club pop up parties. Um, we did probably a handful or a dozen or so last year. Um, and we're going to increase that number this year. So those will be happening. Starting out in LA, cool. eventually spreading to other cities. But um, just kind of meet and greet wine nights and taste some cool wine, meet some people that love wine. and build that community the main parameter for those dates are when billy is traveling because every single one yeah, yeah, i was just yeah. like yeah. when i'm gone <laughs> yeah. that's when the veto had event exactly takes. exactly <laughs> we got it. We got it. awesome well thank you guys so much for having me i appreciate it, it fun. yeah thanks christy yeah. yep we'll talk to you soon okay sounds good <laughs> all right bye bye-bye. All right. I hope everybody enjoyed our interview with Christy and learning more about Vinohead. They are, we forgot to mention actually in the intro that they are long-term friends of the program. Um, their founder, Josh, has, um, I've had lunch with him out here in New York. He's very early contact with Nick, was helping advise, you know, Vint as we got off the ground and encouraging us. So shout out to Vinohead. Everybody should check it out. Subscribe to their mailing list. Um, and yeah, we're going to be back with another episode next week. Uh, We have a few interviews that we have to choose from coming up. So stay tuned. Who knows what will be next? Thanks for tuning in. We'll see you next week. Cheers. To check out our current offerings and to sign up for the Vint platform, find us at www.vint.co. That's www.vint.co. 
For questions, comments, or feedback on the Vint podcast, please email us at support at vint.co. Vint and VV Markets are offering securities pursuant to Regulation A. Our offering circular as amended can be found on the SEC website. Past performance is no guarantee of future results. Investments such as those on the Vint platform are speculative and involve substantial risks to consider before investing. We may provide communication that may contain certain forward-looking statements that are subject to various risks and uncertainties. Information provided in any communications, including this podcast, is not legal, business, or tax advice. All prospective investors should consult a legal, tax, or business advisor concerning the subject matter of any communications and any offering.